Happy New Year and welcome to Truth For Life. Today, Alistair Begg is addressing a topic that is foundational to our Christian life. He's talking about prayer. Almost everyone knows prayer is important, and yet it can be difficult to put prayer into practice. And what do we do when it seems like God isn't answering? How do we respond in those situations? Here's Alistair. What I do want to do is address with you the subject of prayer. So Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him? And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish— will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Father, to come to this subject, we— echo the request of the followers of Jesus. We do want you to teach us how to pray, not simply that we can learn the kind of words to say, but that you will encourage us in the very attitude of our hearts uh, to approach you in the way that Jesus guides us here. Help us now as we think about these things for a moment or two. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, maybe I begin as well by a confession that won't be a surprise to you, but prayer for me is the most difficult of all spiritual exercises, both privately and also publicly. It is a sobering thing to have to pray Sunday by Sunday in front of a congregation, in front of those who know you well. And as we have the privilege of doing so, it is nevertheless a daunting privilege. And so uh, I don't come to this subject as somebody who Uh, has uh, mastered this, but I come to it as someone who is aware of the fact uh, that I need help uh, in mastering it. I think, too, that in saying that, there will be an echo in many of your minds. Um, I I don't think I'm alone in feeling dissatisfied uh, with my attempts at prayer. Um, and, And one of the reasons for the challenge that we face in relationship to this is simply because of the spiritual warfare in which we find ourselves. And uh, there's nowhere, I think, that the devil works more arduously or successfully in the lives of many of us as Christians uh, than in this matter of prayer, or more accurately, in the absence or the, the lack of prayer. And so we ought not to be surprised when we find it difficult. We ought not to be uh, particularly shocked when we realize that uh, uh, we are challenged in this area, uh, just simply uh, to be encouraged by the fact that we're really in good company, uh, in at least the company of the disciples. And we can only but imagine that the disciples, when they had occasion to be uh, with one another and outside the company of Jesus, uh, surely they must have said to each other, I wonder what Jesus says all night. I wonder how he prays for the whole night. I went to find him the other evening, and he was gone again. What do you think he says? 
Why would he do these things? So, uh, even with the best of our intentions, um, I find that my endeavors all, must always uh, fall short. And yet, I don't want to use that as a cop-out either. Uh, some of us uh, are masterful at talking until it comes to praying. And William Cowper, uh, who wrote uh, a number of hymns, uh, best known of all, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, uh, on a hymn that he wrote concerning prayer, he says to us in his poem, "'Have you no words?' So someone says, well, I, could, I was at the prayer time, but I couldn't say anything. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything to pray. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. So Capra says, have you no words? Think again. Words flow apace when you complain and fill your fellow creature's ear with the sad tale of all your care. Very challenging. And then he says, where half the breath thus vainly spent to heaven in supplication sent, your cheerful song would oftener be, hear what the Lord has done for me. Now, to the text before us, uh, it is a, a wonderful illustration. Uh, you have perhaps uh, uh, paid attention to this, perhaps teaching in a class or dealing with your children or even your grandchildren now. And uh, so Jesus has given this instruction, and uh, then it's as if he says, well, I've got one for you. And he said to them, uh, let, me, let me suggest you, you think along these lines. And uh, we have the story of the three friends. Uh, the friend A, who has a friend B, who has shown up unannounced. And so friend A has to go to friend C to tell him about friend B in the hope that friend C will respond to the request of friend A, which, of course, is perfectly clear, I'm sure, by now. Um, <laughs> If you visited in the East, you will know that hospitality is a sacred duty. I remember years ago now being in Istanbul and walking in the street and being accosted by uh, some uh, Turkish man who said to me, sit down, my friend. I said, I said to myself, I'm not your friend. He said, sit down, my friend. And I sat down. And then another friend came and sat next to us both. And then he said, uh, I'm going to give you coffee. And of course, you've had that Turkish coffee. It shouldn't be called coffee. Uh, you can stand, you can stand uh, a spoon up in it. Anyway, I was, I was struck by the fact that the immediate expression of friendship was in hospitality. And of course, that was true in the context in which Jesus uh, was giving this story. We shouldn't think of uh, having a long driveway. We should think of close proximity and so on. So much so that a closed door was a sign that whoever was in that house uh, was happy not to be disturbed. And those same houses in Palestine at the time uh, often only had one room. It would be a kind of split-level operation with two-thirds of it, if you like, on the, on the ground floor, um, just beaten earth, covered perhaps with reeds and so on, and then a slightly raised area uh, that would be uh, providing a measure of safety from creatures that would come in, at least crawling in. And on that raised area, that would be where there would be a charcoal stove, and it would be around that stove that uh, the members of the household would then gather and sleep. So you can imagine them all there, and uh, toes in, as it were, towards the fire, and, and heads out. And when they bedded down for the night, they were bedded down for the night. We're not talking here about a, a four-bedroom place or a duplex or anything like that at all. No. And so it would be virtually impossible to disturb just one individual. In fact, in many cases, these little dwellings were so close to one another within the framework of a village that to disturb even one of the households uh, raised the possibility of creating chaos in the entire village. And so it's in that kind of context that the man, uh, wishing to show hospitality to his traveling friend, uh, goes to his friend's home to borrow bread. All that to say that the story that Jesus is telling here is, uh, is a big deal, and the, the, the approach of the friend is a bold demand, okay? And the request is made on the basis of friendship. 
Uh, the word friend keeps coming again and again, isn't it? Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, because a friend of mine has come, and, and so on. So we're, we, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that friendship is at the heart of this. And the request that is made by this individual is not born out of selfishness, but it is born out of necessity. Now, if you think about it again in, in terms very different from our own, uh, th this is not somebody who had been at uh, a giant eagle uh, earlier in the day, and his kids had eaten all of his food. This is a context in which the food would be made, the bread would be made, usually first thing in the morning, and would easily and almost inevitably be done by the time the evening shadows fell. But of course, we were over and done with by that time, and so uh, when the morning came, there would be time to once again uh, prepare for the opportunities of the day. Somebody would be up early to do that. Well, so it's perfectly understandable that it's not because the, the friend A who's come along has been neglectful. He's just uh, dealing with life as it has unfolded. And since his friend has come, it's only right that he would show him hospitality. He can send him to his bed with nothing to eat, but since he hasn't anything to provide for him, then he has to do what he does. So, he says, if you think about it, if you had a friend, if this friend came at midnight and said to him, give me the three loaves, because somebody has come on a journey, I have nothing to set before him. Imagine, he says, that the answer will come from within, don't bother me. That doesn't sound very nice. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Okay, well, thank you. So Jesus says, I tell you, though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, which is what he should do, right? In actual fact, because of this fellow's impudence or impatience or persistence, he will actually get up and give him what he needs. It's very, very important that we don't go wrong here, because the point of this story surely is not, in application, the reluctance of God to answer. That's not what he's, Jesus is teaching. What Jesus is teaching is the persistence of each of us will display the sense of our own need and of our longing for and our determination to receive an answer. That's, what, that's what's being taught here. Later on in chapter 18, you have the story of the, uh, of the widow who is the persistent widow. That's the way it's framed. Well, that's where that point of emphasis comes. It's not really here. The point is that the generosity of friendship is assumed in this story. It would be a strange thing if the friend operated in that way, and were he to do so, then nevertheless he would finally uh, go along with his friend on the basis of his persistence. Now, what Luke is doing here is he's recording this story told by Jesus to encourage his followers never to cease from praying. All right? Don't quit. The emphasis here is, is actually upon just how impossible it is for a normal human being to refuse anything needful to their friend. In the normal course of events, it is, it is, hospitality demands it. Friendship demands it. So imagine a situation, says Jesus, when this does not happen, and when the person has to keep going at it, then he says, on the basis of his impudence, uh, things will be resolved. So, the one uh, making the request reveals how much he dares to ask and expect from the friendship. And so, the point is fairly straightforward. How much more, then, may the disciple rest assured that God, the heavenly friend, will never refuse anything needful for which sincere prayer is offered. All right? If, in the normal run of events, hospitality demands it of the individual, whereby such a response would make it striking enough to be part and the heart of the story, the point by way of contrast is clear. In the prayer that Jesus has given, the Lord's Prayer as we refer to it, and often pray it that way, and I don't think it's wrong to do so, Having provided, if you like, a, a form of prayer, 
he now is, is seeking to encourage his followers to frame for themselves an attitude of prayer, to understand that for us to come to God uh, in prayer in this way, persistently to come to God on the basis of his friendship, such confidence is not presumption. It's rather grounded in the character and in the promises of God. So, that is why it is vital that we know who God is and what God is as he has revealed himself to us so that we can come to him on the basis of who and what he is. Now, as soon as we say that, we immediately run into questions. And I'm going to assume that this question is at least already in some of your minds. Someone is going to say, well, then is there an absolute promise that we can go to? Since you've said we should come confidently but not presumptuously to God in the awareness of the fact that he is willing to answer the sincere cries of our hearts, is there an absolute promise that we have in the Bible that God will answer every request for healing, that he will give our students all good grades at school, that our businesses will inevitably become a, a rip-roaring success? Well, clearly the answer to that is no. It's no on the basis of our Bibles. It's no on the basis of human experience. That then does not mean that we shouldn't ask but it means that we ask in light of his sovereignty. Because, you see, there are good reasons why God may not always give us what we ask. It would be surprising if, in this group, even at your own table, if you weren't to pause for a moment or two and just say, let's talk not about answers to prayer, but let's talk about the apparent non-answers to prayer. Let's talk about the things that have been on the list, not just for weeks or for months, but actually for years. Now, here is the great test of our understanding of the character of God, the awareness that there are good reasons why he may not give us the things we ask. And, and I could go a list of them, but I'll just mention one or two. First of all, because in certain cases, our prayers are substitutes for our obedience. So we're praying about things we really have no business praying about. Or should I run away with the lady upstairs? The answer to that would be no. Why are you praying about it? Just obey the Bible. There's no reason for you to be having this prayer. All right? That sounds like a heresy, doesn't it? But no, in actual fact, it's true. Well, I'm praying about it. Well, how about you do it? Or how about you stop doing it instead of praying about it? Now, don't take that to an extreme, but, but allow it, uh, because God will often say, I'm not going to give this to you, because you are going to learn uh, more in the absence of uh, this than in the presence of it. The other thing is uh, that we are often, many of us, poor judges of what's good for us. It may well be that the very problem that I'm trying to get rid of has an important part to play in conforming me to the image of Jesus. And since the purpose of God, who works all things for good in those who love him, have been called according to his purpose, the good that he works towards is the conforming us of the image to Jesus. So if his purpose is to conform me to the image of Jesus, and I ask him persistently for something that he knows will not conform me to the image of Jesus, it is because he loves me that he doesn't give me, because he knows that he wants me to become more like Jesus than get the answer to whatever my request might be. It's a reminder to us, isn't it, that uh, we are the clay, he's the potter. Do you think Paul would have been a better preacher without that fear and trembling? When I came to you, brothers, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Lord, would you take away the trembling, please? I'd like to be a very confident person. I'd like to be able to just do this without that, that sense of inadequacy all the time. God says, no, 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 no. I'd like you to continue to have a sense of inadequacy. Whether your name is Paul or Alistair or Susan or Fred or whoever it is. You got the very same thing in Paul in, in Corinthians with his thorn in the flesh. Three times I asked the Lord, take this away from me. 
And three times the Lord said, no chance. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, says Paul, making the logical deduction, if then dependence is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. Therefore, since when I am weak, then I am strong, I will all the more glory in my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. See how upside down that is in thinking? It's the right way up, but it's upside down in so many contemporary views. So, uh, prayer can be a substitute for obedience. Secondly, we're poor judges of what is good for us. And thirdly, we're even poorer judges of what is good for other people. (laughs) That's why it's, it's good to know we have a sovereign God. Sometimes we're asking for our children what isn't wise or what isn't best. Some mother praying that God would take away the inevitable uh, ineptitude of her son and make him a very useful pastor, when in actual fact he'd be a pain in the neck as a pastor. And so God says, no, I'm going to leave him the way he is. Well, but that's what I would like. Well, he says, I know what you would like, but you don't always know what's best for yourself, and you might know what's best for your son or for your daughter. Here's a quote from one of the commentators that may be helpful. If even an imperfect human being, notwithstanding the inconvenience to which he is put, will arrive at midnight to give a friend what he needs if he comes and asks him for help, how much more then will God listen to the sincere prayers and supplications of his children who are really in need? The Attitude of Prayer. That's our subject today from Alistair Begg. You're listening to Truth For Life. We're so glad to have you with us on the first day of a new year. There is no better way to set the pace for the coming months than to root ourselves firmly in God's Word. We hope you'll join us every day in 2020. And if you're looking for a resource to enrich your personal time of study during the new year, we'd love to send you a copy of a devotional called Daily Readings from All Four Gospels for Morning and Evening. This is by the 19th century pastor J.C. Ryle. His extensive, theologically rich, and yet practical commentaries have been reformatted into bite-sized readings, two for each day. This devotional is an excellent way to take a deep dive into the Gospels during 2020, and each study has practical takeaways to help you find personal application from the text. When you donate today to support this ministry in the new year, make sure you request your copy of the devotional Daily Readings from All Four Gospels by J.C. Ryle. The book comes as our way of expressing our sincere thanks, and you can give online at truthforlife.org donate. Please note that our offices are closed today in celebration of the new year. So get in touch with us online or give us a call tomorrow at 888-588-7884. By the way, if you gave a gift during the month of December to help us meet our year-end obligations, I want to express our sincere gratitude for your partnership. Now, before we close, Alistair has a few words to share as we embark on the year 2020. Some of my fondest memories of life in Scotland are tied directly to the first day of a new year. It still holds a tremendous appeal for me and I think for all of us. Another day, a new chapter, all before us. So let me say to you, thank you for last year and I wish you and your family a very blessed and happy new year. Happy new year to you all. I'm Bob Lapine, also wishing you a happy new year. Be sure to join us tomorrow as Alistair concludes his message titled, The Attitude of Prayer. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.